Well, as you see, I, I have no uh, slides. And they're actually all in color, actually. So I'm just going to uh, speak and uh, hope I leave some time for questions and general discussion. So I think there are three important uh, questions that we have to answer if we want to understand biological complexity. Because all of biological complexity, as you know, is encoded in an internal description. And what we would like to do is to read that internal description. Right? So as far as the brain is concerned, we must separate the problem into three places, into three kinds. One, how do the genes work to build nervous systems? It's a problem of construction. Then we have to ask questions of how do nervous systems work to generate behavior? And the third question is, of course, how did it get that way, the questions of evolution? So what I'd like to do is to try and show you how uh, I think we can do all of these things and what insights they will do, give to us. Right? And I think one of the tremendous things that has become available, which uh, is, of course, the complete sequences of the genomes of many organisms. And uh, since I discovered that uh, nobody has actually read the human genome sequence, it's only computers, I started a few years ago reading it starting from the left end of chromosome one <laughs> and just reading it and seeing what there is in it. Now, I want to say why that is important. And so what I'll do is I'll immediately go to tell you uh, how I view the problem of cell type and what we should do about it. Uh, so I think what you should realize is that cell type must be encoded in some way uh, in the genome and that uh, different cell types, which of course explain many of the complexities of components of the nervous system, uh, must, must have an encoding as well. And so what I would like you to do is to imagine this is a complete abstract way of looking at it, that there's something I will call a decision space that operates when we are translating the genome into the structure of the organism, right? And I further make the assumption that at this decision space uh, is a set of binary decisions that essentially operate on defining a novel cell part type pathway as against the default, which is if that switch was not there. So it's a set of binary switches. If you fill in the switch with a one, you'll get the cell type. If you fill it in with a zero, you don't get it, all right? Now, uh, you might ask, and then there is a separate uh, operation we have to do, which is to map this decision space onto time and the 3D space, right? And that could be quite complicated because things move around. But in the abstract, we would like to see this. And so we would say uh, we, would, uh, we would be able to uh, do this uh, in this way, right? These trees are not very deep. And they're probably components of one are used all over the place. And I'll give you some examples in a moment. Okay, so what evidence is there for this theory? Why should it be binary? So the evidence comes from considering, uh, which I think is still our best worked out case, almost complete, which is the retina. So we have two kinds of photoreceptors in the retina. We have uh, rods and we have cones, right? 
and we have then a whole set of machinery uh, that, uh, that these use. Right? So it turns out that uh, one of the marvelous things about uh, the eyes is that there are a lot of people walking around in the world who can do everything. They're perfectly normal, except they can't see properly. So these people are found, and so a great source of my information comes from the ophthalmology literature. Right? And I give you just one example, which I think is very telling. So there are a lot of people who can't see in the dark. Right? When people look at their eyes, which you can do because if light has to come in anyway, you can see what's in there, you can discover very quickly they have no, they have no rods at all. Okay? Their eyes are just full of blue cones. Right? Now, turns out that because of all the work we can do now with the human genome, we find that these are mutations in a transcription factor called NRL. Okay? And NRL then is uh, required to throw the switch to turn a subset of presumptive cones into rods. If you don't throw the switch, they just go to the default pathway. Right. And so one of the ideas is that, uh, oh, all of this could have arisen in evolution, and that's one of the interests then in trying to dissect these trees of decision because what is the, is the ground state uh, that we finally work out will be, will be the original state. And all of this is just add on. So once upon a time, I will declare that the eye started simply as a photoreceptor, uh, as a row of photoreceptors, uh, which were sensitive to blue light. In fact, there is a, one of the jellyfish eyes is exactly that. It's exactly a blue cone, all right? And then what we did is uh, evolve that so that we were able to switch a subset of this. Now, you have to say then, how did, how did this all happen? Because the biochemical machinery and all the products of rods and cones has been duplicated. And so the duplication of these genes and their subsequent divergence or convergence, as the case may be, then explains how all of this arose. And you can ask the question, can we see any traces of this left in the genome? So this is the exciting thing. You don't need any grants to do this. All the information is free. You can sit down and start to analyze the genome and ask yourself, is there any trace left of the original pathway? Now, I, it turns out that, in fact, the human genome, uh, the human lineage, is the slowest evolving of all, of all the lineages we know. It can be shown that mice are something like 180 million years into the future. Okay, so you have to get a different perspective on the dynamics of genome evolution when you think about this. So in one sense, they're far in advance of us, but in, in another sense, they're just a branch of the tree that went very rapidly. Now, given that, we can start to investigate this. Now, it has been known for some time that there has been patterns of evolution, been patterns of genome duplication. In fact, it is believed there were two rounds of whole genome duplication. And in fish, it turns out to be a third round. Now, each round of duplication is followed by shuffling. 
things get lost, things get moved around, and so on. And so you can tell, you can tell by, uh, you need a shuffling, and you need a movement at a much smaller scale than that to explain it anyway. And so there is an alternative theory, uh, which is that we just duplicated pieces of it at any time. But because we're doing pieces, we have linkage. And whichever way you look at it, whether you're given a rubber to rub out what you don't want, or you're given, or you have to work out the, the duplication by insertion, those are too symmetrical. They're very difficult to distinguish. It doesn't matter for our discussion now, right? But I think they can be distinguished. So we have this, we shuffle this, and so we can have a, a concept of linkage, which essentially is the same we would use in ordinary genetics for alleles, but we now use it for these things that, that have diverged in the genome. Okay, now as you know, when you have two genes that are the same, uh, in the same genome or similar, you call them paralogs, I call these linked, uh, these linked groups. They have to be two or more. I call them crickologs. Uh, they're spelled K-R-I-K-O, logs. It comes from the Greek krikos, meaning a ring. It's a link in a chain. So we have these linked duplications. Now, the beauty of that is they tell us that originally there was one copy of this, fully functional, and then when the genome duplicated, there were two copies of this. And of course, we can now look to see what has happened since then. If you do this, I'll give you one very good example, which so you can see the flavor of it. So today, if you look in our genomes, you'll find two genes for a special kind of actin, which is found in smooth muscle, okay? One of these is found in the smooth muscle of your arteries. One of these is found in the smooth muscle of your intestines, okay? So both of these are components of crickologs. So you can tell that the linkage has been conserved, so there hasn't been any fooling around with this. We can now investigate what has happened to the promoters, to all the components of these two genes. All right, now, this is particularly interesting to do when you come to transcription factors, because the plethora of transcription factors has duplicated in much the same way. And, I, and by making an analysis of this, and by seeing when when this happened, we can now begin to search amongst these things for uh, the transcription uh, encoding of, of, of this. Now, why is it important to look at transcription facts? Everybody says that it's all gonna be due to differences in gene, in gene expression. And there are vast projects to look at the gene expression in every particular cell. Uh, you've seen some of them here. I've t I take the view that we should only look at the gene expression for the transcription factors. The reason for this is the following. I wanna know what keeps you as a going concern because you haven't been written once. All your proteins are turning over so to keep you going, we have to have transcription all the time. So there is a reduced formula, which is just of the transcription factors, which in principle, we could describe you or describe you in your various tissues, right? Now that reduced formula means that if we knew that, we could compute the rest once the molecular biologists tell us what this transcription factor does. But I think we could probably deduce a lot of that from the genome itself. 
However, the reason why we want to, to couple this with my first remarks is the following. It is necessary for the hypothesis that when you turn a transcription factor on, you've got to leave it on. Because clearly, if there was something else required to keep it on, you've got the wrong transcription factor. Okay? So we must have a transcription factor which, once switched on, keeps itself on and can do it. So that is a necessary requirement. If you go back and look at uh, Hal Weintraub's work uh, on my OD, you'll see that that, was a, that is a condition. That is effectively obeyed there. It's obeyed by NRL. It's obeyed by a lot of the switch transcription factors. Okay. Now, that says that if we want to get a classification of this, that the most interesting thing we could do is know which transcription factors are switched on in different cells because you realize these will be the masters. They will get others. Uh, they will hook up with others. And in fact, if you look at this hierarchy of transcription factors which then determine what the final output will be, it's very much like a it's very much like a neural diagram in itself. It has synapses, if you like. It also has inhibitory signals. And so we really need to decode that uh, completely. Well, I think that if you ask, what is this we should do? What is the rate-limiting thing? We can't go around making... Uh, there may be 2,000 transcription factors, say a tenth of the genome, that we would really like to know about. And of course, uh, that's a big reduced over the 25,000 or whatever number of loci we have. But I think the most important thing is to know which is active. And so the best thing is to find a transcription factor in the nucleus of a cell. Therefore, the way to approach this, I think in a high throughput way, is by antibodies. Now, if we had antibodies that work to every transcription factor, we could map, the, we give them to the Allen Institute and say, okay, guys, here you are. Just tell us what is the distribution of these in the nuclei uh, of all the cells in the in the brain, and then we can work out what the hierarchies are, and we'll learn a lot that way. Now, of course, the antibody is very slow to, to be made in the present way. So I'm working on a very high throughput method of making antibodies, because I think there's a lot of, but there's a lot that we know about this that can be harnessed to it. And these are the reagents that I think once we have them, we can do this not only for man, which is what I'm keen on, uh, because I think we can, really, we can really approach it in ourselves and ask interesting questions, but also for any animal and, of course, for any subset of, of reagents that, that you want to do. So I... I think even if it works only 50% of the way, maybe incomplete, it's worthwhile trying to do a map of few of these uh, at this time. Well, that's all I have to say. <laughs>